All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the morning session. I assume people will kind of filter in as we go, uh, given that it is only 9 a.m. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about kind of actually a variety of topics that, that kind of build upon the lecture from last time, or my lecture from last time, uh, but which also are, are going to be fairly, fairly fast and fairly high level. Um, in particular, I'm going to cover, we talked yesterday and you saw in later lectures too, about a bunch of different machine learning algorithms. In particular, I talked about support vector machines, linear regression, and logistic regression. Um, still pretty high level for them, but at least I gave the loss function and kind of wrote it down a little bit more explicitly, the formulation for these, for these algorithms. Um, and today what I want to do is just highlight a few other algorithms that you may run into as well as you study machine learning and it's kind of are exposed to machine learning algorithms. And this is going to be even higher level. Some of them will be covered in great depth by further lectures in the course. Some of them will not be, um, but they are quite common, and so you should sort of know what these are. And the goal of this was really just to highlight the fact that a lot of different algorithms can be cast in this same framework of hypothesis class, loss function, and optimization algorithm. I'll then talk very briefly about another kind of learning, which is called unsupervised learning. Um, today, I believe, we'll also carry a lecture on reinforcement learning, which is yet another type of, of machine learning approach. Um, but unsupervised learning is, is quite common, and so we'll talk about a few ways of interpreting that and a few different algorithms. Finally, I'll get the probability. So, so far I've really been light on probability. I haven't really mentioned it at all. You've seen a little bit maybe in, in uh, subsequent lectures. But I want to at least highlight how probability can enter in to this framework of hypothesis class, loss function, and optimization algorithm. Because there actually, is, there actually are very close and tight-knit connections between these two. And it's good to at least understand from a high level how probability can, be, can enter into the equation here. Though, of course, probabilistic models uh, are a much, much bigger topic. And, and you, there are entire courses on these things. So this is going to be a very light treatment. Uh, and finally, I'll say I'll have two slides on evaluating machine learning algorithms. Uh, mainly taking some, you know, similar to what Alex said, there are certain things that people do wrong when it comes to evaluating methods. And I want to just highlight uh, a couple of these. Though I think actually I would say that what I'm going to talk about here is I see this less and less these days, um, the mistakes people, people can make here. All right, so let's start with a couple other machine learning algorithms. Remember, the framework we had yesterday was that there were kind of three ingredients to a machine learning algorithm, right? There was, first of all, the hypothesis class. We called this H theta. Secondly, there was the loss function. Uh, we called this L. And this was different based upon um, whether we were talking about a regression problem or a classification problem. But there were also different possible loss functions for regression and different possible loss functions for classification, which lead to different algorithms in machine learning. And then finally, there was an optimization method. Optimization method. And these, the main ones I talked about yesterday were for most problems, gradient descent type algorithms, and you'll see a lot more of that going forward, gradient type methods and stochastic gradient methods. I also talked about um, exact solutions for least squares at least. I'll talk more about optimization in general on Friday's lecture, uh, but for now I just want to highlight the fact that these algorithms, these different machine learning algorithms, can be looked at in this framework uh, as long as you consider the fact that they can also use different optimization algorithms. All right, so let's just jump right in. Here are a bunch of classes of machine learning algorithms, some of which you have heard, some of which you might not have heard of, um, which, though they aren't always presented this way, fall very nicely into this framework. 
Um, so the first one is a very broad class called kernel methods. Now you'll hear a lot more about kernel methods next week. Uh, Andrew Wilson is going to be giving two lectures on these. And while this is a very, very simplified treatment here, and, they, and there's much more depth to these, um, in some sense, kernel methods can be thought of like a linear predictor. They're actually very similar. In particular, for a kernel method, the hypothesis class is the following. It's a linear function, much like um, our linear regression case, or any linear hypothesis class, uh, sum from i equals 1 to m of theta i times this function k of x and xi. Okay, now a couple things here to note. First of all, uh, and, and I should say this, this function k is called a kernel function, and it essentially intuitively to evaluate some kind of similarity between how similar x is to xi, how similar these two arguments are, where bigger means more, simu uh, more similar. And <clears throat> a couple things to note here. First of all, that this hypothesis class is still linear in the parameters theta, so you can still use almost all the same loss functions and or optimization methods. These actually are very used for how you actually optimize these things. And um, you can use all the same different sort of loss functions uh, and optimization methods as we were doing with, say, a linear classifier or a linear regression method. All right, and that leads, leads to a different class of algorithms um, for, for these different loss functions. Now, a couple points to take home. First of all, uh, I'm wrapping a lot of complexity around this k function here, and really this is a very, very <laughs> uh, inexact and high-level treatment of kernels. You'll see much more. There are a lot of ways to interpret exactly what this kernel function is doing, including um, embedding the data into a higher dimension uh, with very high-dimensional input vectors, though without ever actually constructing these things explicitly. That's one interpretation of this. Um, another interpretation is a sort of a more, even more theoretical one about uh, inner product spaces and these kind of things, but I'm not sure if even uh, Andrew will get that, that in detail. Um, but the other thing to notice is, is two things here. First of all, unlike before, where we had, uh, where we're sort of our input vector was, remember, a vector that has n dimensions, and we have m different examples, the thing to notice here is that I'm actually taking a sum from i equals 1 to m. And so I have to have I have to compute this kernel function between my input, my new input I compute my hypothesis on, and all the examples in my training set. Remember, the sum over i here is indexing not over just, just the parameters, but also over all the examples in the training set. Uh, and this means two things. This means, first of all, there was some discussion yesterday about sort of you know, the relative size of the parameters and the um, number of examples we had. And here they're actually the same. So here we have the same number of parameters, theta, as examples. We actually have m of them. So m equals n in this case. And that means these issues that we at least touched on, like overfitting and uh, you know, how, you, how you deal with that, they, they, you can't just sweep them under the rug. You have to deal with those things. And it's typically dealt with by regularization. So if you add regularization to your loss function here and minimize that or minimize the sum of loss functions over, over this, this leads to what we typically think of as kernel methods. Um, the second point that this also relates to is the fact that to compute my hypothesis or my prediction on a new example, I have to compute some function of that example and all my training data. So that means I have to keep all my training, at least without optimizations, I should say, I have to keep all my training data around. Right? I sort of have to store it in memory, and every time I want to make a new prediction, I have to do a complete pass over all my data. Now, as you might imagine, for big problems, that becomes very inefficient. And so a lot of work, and sort of the exciting work, really, and what makes kernels, uh, what makes kernels scalable to large problems, is the fact that there are ways to approximate this. And oftentimes, they're actually exploiting the sort of more um, the other interpretations of what this kernel function is. So by exploiting that properly, you can come up with ways of approximating this very closely that actually don't require you to keep all your data around. But at least the naive kernel method does require you to keep all your data around. So that's kernel methods. One slide. 
Um, <laughs> again, we'll see a lot more of this. Um, another class of methods, which I'll just touch on briefly, because you may also see this, is called nearest neighbor methods. Nearest neighbor methods are interesting. What they do is very simple. Um, what you do to make a prediction is you look for the most similar example in your data set, and you just predict the same label as what you saw there. Um, for both regression or classification, you can do either one. Uh, so this notation here, I'm saying that H, so this is kernel, this is nearest neighbor, I'm saying that H theta of X equals Y, um, and this is kind of a little bit annotation here, but remember Y would index over, you know, Y sub whatever says the, you know, Y sub I says the ith training example in our data. And so here what we do is we pick whichever example Y is closest to our input point. And the way we write that here is we say the argmin over J. So what that says is whichever parameter J minimizes this thing to come, pick that J. Um, and we're going to say, oh, I, I just realized I have an I. I, I guess I use the argument over I there. Sorry. Argument over I. Uh, X minus XI. OK. And um, I think we saw this yesterday, actually, this notation here. But just in case you haven't seen it before, this term here is the two norm squared of a vector, which is just equal to all the elements squared. OK, so essentially, if you take a difference here, take a 2 norm squared, that is actually kind of a, a measure of how far away those two, those two vectors are. So what we do is we just, let me kind of wipe this out here. All right, so what we do is we just look for, given the input to our hypothesis function h, we look for the thing in our training data that is closest to that in this distance, and we pick that one and predict that output. You can also do you know, the closest k. Uh, of them. This is called k-nearest neighbor, and you can take the average of the k-closest ones, but it's essentially a very similar type method. Now, one thing to note here is that this method here requires no real training, right? We don't actually have to fit any, there really kind of are no parameters here. I mean, theta doesn't really enter in here. Um, and just like the kernel functions, uh, this also means, though, that we have to keep all the data around in order to make our prediction, right? Because we have to search for every time we want to make a prediction, we have to search through all the data to find the closest one and predict the, the, the corresponding output. Um, and I forget if I said this word before uh, or not, but essentially these are, these are called non-parametric methods. Uh, kernels are also called non-parametric. It's important to note that non-parametric does not mean there are no parameters. It, what it really means is that the number of parameters is growing with the size of the, of the data. Uh, so we, we do not have a fixed number of parameters. Rather, we have a variable number of parameters that depend on um, the size of our data set. And these are sort of nearest neighbor methods are one of kind of the classic non-parametric examples because here there actually essentially are no parameters. I mean, maybe you have some parameters on how you want to do that uh, distance function, but we won't worry about that. OK, um, neural networks you've seen already. There's going to be much more today, so I won't dwell on this. Uh, neural networks essentially are nonlinear uh, classifiers where you have some nonlinear function like a nonlinear activation function, like the sigmoid function we talked about before, and you get the final output by composing many of these nonlinear functions together. So the hypothesis class is this nonlinear function here. Loss function is the, um, it can usually be squared error between your output and your input. And optimization is things like gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. Um, now, one important thing is that unlike a lot of other methods so far we've talked about, uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to find the actual optimal set of parameters for a neural network. But this is actually typically OK. Um, you can typically still find pretty good ones using the methods that, that Quark's going to talk about later today. And there have been some real sort of major successes for these in recent years. They're, they're sort of a very uh, exciting topic these days again. They were before, now they're, they're sort of coming back. Uh, or I guess they have come back for a while, I suppose. All right, um, a couple more, I think just two more. One more um, type of, of uh, 
classifier, machine learning algorithm you might see are called decision trees. These are actually one of the first machine learning algorithms, or sort of at least one of the first ones to really gain traction as machine learning algorithms and called machine learning. Um, and what these do is these partition the input space into different regions by essentially looking at a single variable and branching on that variable. So for example, um, if we have a two-dimensional input and we want to say predict a binary classification task, then what this tree here says is that we first look to see if the second coordinate is greater than or less than or greater less than two. If it is, yes, we go down this path. If it's not, we go down this path. So if it is greater than two, we just predict negative one. If it's not, we look to see if the first coordinate is greater than negative three or not. Um, if it is, then we pr so if it, if it is, then we predict negative one. If it's not, we predict positive one. So essentially, they just go through kind of a, 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 this list of rules in a tree form and make the final prediction. So our hypothesis class here actually ends up being a kind of a, a, a tree structure that will partition the data set into different regions. Now at each final node here, you could either just make a single prediction, just say this is, this is just going to be, if I ever get here, I'm just always going to predict plus one. But you can also extend this to actually have linear regression functions at the roots. Um, sorry, at the, at the leaves of the tree. Or even more complicated functions. And I think actually one of the functions that, that Nano talked about yesterday was kind of like that. You would partition the space, and then at, at each root, sorry, I keep saying that, at each leaf, you would have a Gaussian process that determined your function. So these are, can be very, very powerful here. So our hypothesis class in this case is these partitionings of the space. The loss function for the typical decision tree is a little bit more complex. Um, but you actually can look at standard ways of training decision trees as minimizing kind of something that's sort of like logistic loss. Um, it actually ends up being not quite that, but it is sort of a probabilistic type loss, which I'll get to later. That's the loss function they're optimizing. But the real key here is that unlike a lot of the classes we've seen before, I guess other than neural networks, there's no real way to optimize exactly over the class of all decision trees. Right? We can't, like with linear regression, just find the optimal solution, find the optimal tree. So what we do instead is we actually kind of greedily split the data um, in, the thing, in, in, in a way that starts making the most progress towards minimizing that loss function. So essentially, we have some loss function that's kind of like a probabilistic loss. And we pick the first node in order to most minimize that loss. And that we can do. We can pick one node to minimize loss. Then we branch upon that one node. And then for those two subsequent nodes, we do this process again. So this, you can think of this kind of as a greedy type of optimization that tries at each iteration to minimize this loss function over one coordinate at a time. Again, sort of very high level here, but that's kind of what uh, decision trees are doing. And you will see these a lot. Now, you actually don't see them much on their own anymore. What you typically see them uh, is combined with what's called an ensemble method. What these are, very generally speaking, is ensemble methods. Um, ensemble. I won't write out the hypothesis class for the uh, decision tree because it's actually a lot easier to see it graphically. An ensemble method is really just a combination of other of other hypotheses. Uh, other hypotheses. So our you know final hypothesis is just going to be equal to some uh, weighted combination, say say over k other hypothesis classes. Where now our parameters here are just, say, the weights on those different classes. And of course, you know, each sub-hypothesis here would have its own set of parameters. And so we should really write this as you know, uh, theta being both the parameters for the weighting and the parameters on each individual hypothesis class. But I'm just sort of using brief notation here. Um, some that you might have heard of, in particular, are, are two very common types. And these actually both often use decision trees as the individual hypotheses here. So they're kind of stacking these things in a very, in a very kind of nice way. Uh, one is random forests. And that is essentially an ensemble of decision trees, because you know, many trees are a forest, um, where each tree is built on different subsets of the data. 
And it's a very simple idea, but it actually ends up, if you just sort of want a simple algorithm that will perform well on a lot of problems, random forests do, do very, very well. They're sort of a very robust algorithm. They do well on a lot of different problems. Another one you might have heard about is boosting. Uh, boosting is also a way of combining different classifiers. Again, often decision trees. And you can actually view boosting as minimizing. So the hypothesis class is the ensemble method where each hypothesis is, say, a tree. The loss function ends up being an exponential loss function. So this is one I didn't really talk about too much, but it was on the slides before. Uh, exponential loss is one of them. And boosting actually it looks like a, a, again, kind of a greedy optimization approach to minimizing exponential loss with whatever hypothesis class you want as the base classifier. So that's sort of a very brief, brief overview. I didn't really do any sort of justice to all these methods. But the thing to sort of keep in mind is you probably will see these algorithms as you work in machine learning. And it's good to at least know that though the fit isn't always perfect, they weren't really developed necessarily with this kind of framework in mind. The, it, you can still typically actually uh, view them this way. So it's very, it's very easy to think of these algorithms as having a hypothesis class, minimizing some loss function, using some optimization method. And, and you can fit most algorithms into that framework, at least most supervised algorithms. OK, so again, very, very brief, but you'll see a lot more detail about some of these. All right, so let's talk about now, again, <laughs> very shortly, about unsupervised learning. So remember that our basic pipeline for supervised learning, that we have some training data, so we have some, say, digits and their corresponding labels. We use machine learning to come up with some hypothesis function such that when we apply it to the training data, it kind of gives us approximately the outputs that we want. And then we make predictions based upon new data that we don't have the labels for. Right? That's the overall pipeline. Now, unsupervised learning seems really hard because basically we had the same pipeline, except we take away the labels. We don't tell it anything about what these outputs should be. And it seems like kind of everything we talked about so far will kind of break down then, right? Because now, um, I mean, the whole point of this hypothesis class, right? And I'll write it here. The whole point was that we had you know, some input xi. We had some input xi, right? And we wanted it to be the case that when we applied our hypothesis function to this, this was approximately equal to the corresponding yi. This is how we measure loss then, you know, the difference between these two things. How can we do this when we don't have yi's anymore? Right? So our setting is somewhat the same. We have still our input features. We still have some model parameters. And I think now um, I'm just going to abandon, I, I, I sort of have done it slowly, but before, in the lecture before, the number of parameters was always equal to the, num the, the size of the input vectors. Um, but actually, if you look at almost all the things I've shown you before, the other hypothesis classes, this is not the case anymore. So I'm just going to abandon that for now and just call my model parameters, uh, say that there's some other size uh, k, we have k different parameters, which is not always the same as our input size. It's a little aside, but I'm going to now refer to theta as being an rk. Um, so we have this same setup. You know, we have some model parameters, we have some new, some some input features, but what does this even mean, right? What's the point? You know, what, what do we do here when we uh, don't have any outputs to you know aim our hypotheses towards? And there's actually a couple of ways to view unsupervised learning, but one interpretation that actually encompasses a lot of different unsupervised learning methods is to say that unsupervised learning is really about trying, in some sense, to reconstruct the input data. Okay? So we're trying to take, so we have a hypothesis function as before. We're going to do something kind of strange. We're going to say that I actually, we don't have y's. 
So I actually want my hypothesis function, when I apply it to xi, to be approximately equal to xi. Okay? So this now means our hypothesis class is no longer you know, a function mapping from xn to, or sorry, rn to r. Our hypothesis function, uh, this function is now going to be a mapping from rn to rn. And we want it to be chosen, or we want to choose our parameters rather, such that xi, when we apply the hypothesis function, that approximately equals xi. That sounds weird to you, hold on a sec, because it seems like you could do this really easily, right? And you wouldn't really learn very much. Um, and similarly, the loss function now, because we're measuring the distance between these, these two things, we need a loss function that's also going to accept two input vectors as, as inputs. So the loss function will now be will now be a mapping from Rn by Rn to R plus two uh, two dimension n vectors as input, and we get an output. And a common one, for example, would just be that distance we saw before when we were measuring like the nearest neighbor, um, when we were finding nearest neighbors of, uh, of functions. And this is just sort of the generalization of squared loss to, uh, to multivariate inputs. And so a common one, for example, would just be to say that the, the thing we're trying to minimize here That's just going to be the uh, two norm of the difference between these two things. This way. Squared two norm. Though it doesn't really matter if you squared or not. X, I. X, I. Oops. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about the, sort of the, the, the setup here? A minus sign, oh. Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. All right. So, of course, the obvious question that maybe you're all thinking about is that well, this seems kind of silly, right? Because we could just choose H to output whatever we input into it. And that would give us zero loss. And it wouldn't really, we wouldn't, you know, there would be effectively no parameters and we wouldn't really have learned anything. Uh, clearly wouldn't have learned anything, right? Because there's just no, you know, why not just choose H theta of X equals X? What's preventing us? Well, of course, to stop this, what we have to do is restrict the class of functions we can consider in our hypothesis class, right? We can't consider sort of all possible functions, or even let alone all possible functions. We can't even consider any function class that would include this function, because that would clearly minimize the loss and it wouldn't give us any information. So what we have to do instead is somehow restrict this hypothesis class to not allow that and to force the function in some sense to need to um, extract some structure out of the data in order to actually come up with a hypothesis function that can, can minimize this loss. And in fact, just like our problem for supervised learning, we kind of had one canonical minimization problem that kind of fit a lot of these things. We can do the same for classification, so, or sorry, for unsupervised learning. Uh, so we can write a lot of these problems as minimize. Boy, I'm just writing a lot of typos on the board here today. Minimize over theta sum from i equals 1 to m. 
of L H beta x i x i. So this becomes kind of our, just like we had the canonical loss minimization for classification and regression, this is the one for unsupervised learning. So I think the best way to see this is actually is rather than just sort of thinking about this conceptually, is just look at two examples. Um, look at two examples that both fit into this framework, though they seem quite different. Um, these two algorithms are called k-means and principal component analysis. And they're typically taught not in this kind of framework, but you can do them both in this framework. Okay, so I'm just going to cover them very briefly uh, to kind of get the intuition, but focus upon how they actually do fit into this framework. Um, let's get a new, get a new board. Maybe I will do this. Well, you're going to have to, unfortunately, I think. Uh, You can see the very top of the screen, right? You can still see that hypothesis function up, or that uh, minimization function up there. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at k-means. What k-means says is that our our parameters are going to be a set of k different points in the input space. I'm going to call those mu one to mu k where each of these is the same size as the input vector. Okay? And our hypothesis class, you know, we can't just sort of pick any output we want. We have to output one of those k numbers as our prediction um, that we're going to, you know, compare to our input value x. All right? So our hypothesis class is we have to output one of these k numbers. And of course, if you want to sort of do any reasonable job of this, you'll probably pick the one that's closest, in fact, to your input. So the hypothesis function ends up being mu, and again, this is kind of cumbersome notation here, but you pick the mu such that it minimizes the distance between x and mu. All right, so you look at, compare all of these to the different mu, compare, compare the x to all the different mu's, um, and just pick the one, return the one that minimizes this distance. And then given that, I just want to minimize the, the sort of standard optimization problem here. Now, Unlike a lot of the things we've seen before, though I guess similar to algorithms like neural networks, we can't solve this exactly. Uh, it ends up being that this sort of this kind of hypothesis class here, you can't really. I mean, it isn't so nice to take gradients of this. It's just you can't really. Unlike least squares, you can't write out an exact solution of this. Um, and so the typical way to actually solve this, rather than the things we've seen, exactly the things we've seen before, is to actually alternate between two steps. So what you do in the first step is you find, for all the data points in your training set, you find the closest mean to those. Right, so you find, you, you find whichever mean is, in fact, the minimizer here. And then you just recompute that mean to be all the things that are assigned to it. Essentially, all the, all the examples in your data set that were closest to that mean, you take the new mean to be the mean of those examples. Okay? So, uh, kind of very high level there, but hopefully the intuition comes across that we are trying to minimize squared loss here. This is our hypothesis class. And the intuition, the way we're limiting ourselves, is that we're restricting our hypothesis to only output one of these k values. Therefore, we can't just always output the input, right? Because there's just not, if you, as long as you have uh, m greater than k, you can't just output the input always. You have to figure out what are the k's, or sorry, what, what are the means that most closely, uh, that sort of do the best job of minimizing that loss function. Any questions? These mu's? They don't have to be the x size. 
They can be anything. They're just numbers. They're just vectors in R or N. Uh, no, they definitely don't have to be the, the X size. In the optimization procedure, sort of a way of actually minimizing this loss is to set them to be averages of different XIs, but that's kind of incidental. Uh, I'm actually kind of glossing over that intentionally because the high level point here is that you're just trying to pick those means that minimize this loss. And the way this is sort of typically, typically seen, um, you might see a picture of this, which, which I didn't really want to highlight too much, but if you have some data um, that looks like this, well, and you have, say, two different means, well, a good strategy would be to pick one mean to be here, because this one would be the output for all the guys in here, and one mean kind of here, because that would be the output that the you know, one's closest to all the x's in here. And so what you do essentially is, you know, hopefully if you do a good job of optimizing, you'll you know, assign at some point these to one cluster and these to another cluster, and then you'll find the means appropriately, and then everything looks, works well. Yeah? Good value of k, that's a good question. Um, so much like all the other problems we've had here, um, for example, the same thing with how do you choose a good value of lambda if you're regularizing? How do you do these things? Um, a good way of doing this is actually through cross-validation, too. Um, so what you can do is you can compute this loss. You can, again, divide your training set into uh, inputs and outputs. Sorry, <laughs> inputs and outputs. Divide your training set into uh, training and validation um, without any outputs here. Um, and use the validation set to evaluate this loss. All right. Now, this doesn't work quite as well for clustering as it does for, um, for classification or regression. But you can still use the same point, actually. And part, one of the advantages of this loss formulation is that it actually kind of makes clear what you're trying to solve. And so this sort of separation can actually work. It can give you something. Um, whereas a lot of sort of typical views of k-means, it's just kind of, well, there looks like two things here. I'll pick two. That works great for two dimensions sometimes, because sometimes there aren't even clear two, two clusters here. Um, but what's really nice about this loss function formulation is you can do the same thing, and you can use a holdout validation set to actually evaluate how many clusters you should pick. So another algorithm that fits into this exact same framework, um, well, the general framework up there, is principal component analysis. And here, so this here, uh, I should have titled it better. This here is k-means. And this here will be principal component analysis. And the idea here is that the outputs that we're going to predict, they're no longer from some fixed class of, of inputs. Instead, they're going to lie on a lower dimensional space. And the way we write that formally is the following. We say that our, our hypothesis, first of all, our parameters um, are going to be two matrices, um, theta 1 and theta 2. The sizes are here. I won't bother writing those. Theta 1 is going to be n by k. Theta 2 is going to be k by n. So these are matrices now. Um, and we have k less than n. So for example, theta 2 is going to be a fat matrix. And theta 1 will be a skinny matrix. And the hypothesis class says, I'm going to output the following. Theta 1 times theta 2 times x. OK. And we didn't really cover linear algebra here, so, so if this is a little bit confusing, don't, don't worry about it. Um, essentially what this is doing is because theta 2 is of lower dimension than x, this operation here forces this vector to take on, uh, to be a vector in Rk. And since k is less than n, this vector here has less information in it than the original input vector. 
Then we multiply by this thing here, which will put us back into the original space of our n, so we can compare with our examples. But essentially what's happening here is that this step here is kind of compressing the data. We have to throw away information. We can't keep it all anymore. Um, one way of looking at this visually is to think of this like, as the following. And I should also say that, that okay, with, with, so with this, with this function here, we again just solve that problem. That leads to this optimization problem. Um, this one is also non-convex. Don't worry about that other two there. Just the same uh, as all the other norms we have. Um, this problem is also not what we typically think of as a solvable problem, but it actually ends up being a case that this is one of the few problems that we actually can solve efficiently, even though it's not what's called a convex problem. So we actually can solve this using uh, something called an eigenvalue decomposition. All right, so we can find the exact solution here, even though it might not look like we can at first. Yeah. You can keep k greater than n. So if k is greater than n, it's a little bit odd, right? Because then you have this function back in your class, right? The function of uh, h of theta equals x is still in your class. You just pick these to be the identity matrices. So say k equals n here. These are both the identity. Um, that means just your hypothesis is predict what you saw as input. So you can do that, uh, but it isn't very useful. You don't get a lot of value out of it. The actual value of PCA comes from the fact that you are compressing the data, and so you are finding this reduced dimension the data lies in, and then projecting it back into the higher dimension. Um, one way of viewing this is, if, if this is your data originally, so say you have two-dimensional input data, and theta, and say k, so, so n here is 2, and pick k to be equal to 1. Okay, what this looks like graphically is you have to take all your data and essentially find the line that you want to predict it all lies on. So you, so you, you know, you, you want to predict the points, this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here. So the closest points to these, to these uh, data points that lie on a line. And what PCA is actually doing is it's finding, because what, so essentially when you do this operation, you get a one dimensional quantity that says where you lie along this line, and then you project back into two dimensions. That gives you sort of this figure again, but they all lie on this one, one line here. And what's happening here is that essentially PCA is picking both these points, what they actually are, and the best line you could draw through your data. Now, of course, in higher dimensions, n can be you know, 10, and if k was 2, then you'd be finding the best plane that fit through those, those dimensions. And you know, higher, if you're finding a good hyperplane that fits through that. Yeah? Um, okay, that's a good point, yeah. So, so I, I, the, the, the way I'm also doing this is I'm also talking, so, okay, um, good point. If x is the original dimension, you can always do the same trick where you add 1 to it. There's two, there's two, there's two things you can do here. Um, the first is you can add 1 to your input vector and kind of get away from this. The better thing to do, actually, is to, before you apply PCA, to actually center your data around the origin so that actually you just subtract the mean off so that actually this, I didn't write any you know, axes here, so I'm actually fine to do this, so I, I wasn't lying to you. This, uh, you didn't know, this, this was 0, 0 here, of course. That's what I meant. Um, so you can do that, too. You can do either one. This is probably the better one to do. There's another question over there. No. OK. All right. <clears throat> so that's all I'm going to say about unsupervised learning. Uh, it's a very big field, but uh, and not always presented this way. But I think you can view it in a very similar framework. There's a lot of value to viewing it in the same kind of loss framework. All right. Second to last thing, prob probability. So I, I've somehow managed, as I mentioned yesterday, to avoid talking about probability when talking about machine learning for almost three hours. Um, but of course, these things are very tied together. And the reason, uh, really, probabilistic models underlie a huge range of machine learning algorithms. And I, you know, I use things like, like logistic loss and kind of said, there's some probabilistic interpretation here. Um, and same with uh, 
Same with least squares. There's actually a reason, or there can be a reason, why we choose the squared loss function as opposed to anything else. And really, probabilistic models underlie a lot of the basic choices of machine learning. And they also let us interpret the results in, in a better way that actually captures sort of how we are uncertain about the data. And that's really where probabilistic models can come in handy because they can give you not just a prediction, but they can let you interpret that in terms of you know, maybe how certain you are about your predictions. So let's, let's think about this for a second. Why did we pick the squared loss? You know, we picked, when we did a linear regression, I said let's use this loss function that minimizes, you know, takes the distance between um, the output that we predicted and the true output, and we predict, or our loss rather, is the, is the squared difference there. Why did we choose that? Uh, and one answer that I gave yesterday was, well, we choose it because it's easy to optimize and it's kind of nice. And that's actually a perfectly good reason. Uh, but we can think of other reasons too. And actually one of the motivations for why we use squared loss comes from probability. So here's the idea. This is a very general concept that's used all over the place in machine learning. And it would probably be you know, a bad idea to not mention it at all in a, in a lecture on machine learning. The idea is the following. We're going to hypothesize that the outputs on our data set are not just almost equal to the hypothesis, they're actually equal to the hypothesis class. There actually is, say, some underlying model that outputs the y's as the hypothesis class. That could be you know, either a, a linear function there, a, a, you know, some other hypothesis class, etc. But we don't actually observe the real outputs here. What we observe is the output plus some noise term. So in particular, all our yi's we observe are the true hypothesis class plus some noise term. And one very common noise term would be a Gaussian random variable. So this is the density of a Gaussian random variable here. It has probability density of that form. Another way to write this would be to say, well, if you just rearrange terms here, one thing we can write is we can write the probability of y, or really the probability density of y, given x and parameterized by theta, that's sort of this whole thing here, the probability of this is also given by a Gaussian density. So this also equals 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma x negative h theta x minus y squared over 2 sigma squared. Sigma here is the variance of this Gaussian distribution, but it actually ends up not, if, it's, if you assume it's some known quantity, it actually ends up not affecting uh, what kind of loss function we get. And now you do the following. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I'm defining a model this way. I'm defining what's the probability of my output, of an output given an input and parameterized by some theta. What I want to do, what would be a reasonable thing to do here, if I want to choose theta based upon this model, this probabilistic model, is to choose the theta that maximizes what I actually saw. Okay, so what I saw was a bunch of y's and x's if we assume furthermore that these are all independent and identically distributed random variables, so they all have this same distribution here and they're all independent from each other, then we can write the probability of what we saw, namely y1 through ym, as the product of all those probabilities evaluated at the data points that we've seen. And a reasonable thing to do then would be to pick the thetas that make that probability as high as possible. So that makes sense? So basically what we have is we have the probability of our data, so given a bunch of xi and yi's, the probability of our data is going to be equal to um, the product of all these terms, the probability of yi given xi parameterized by theta. And um, we want to just find the theta that maximizes this. Okay, so this is kind of a probabilistic uh, 
approach here because what we're doing is we're defining a probabilistic model for our data based upon some parameters. And by the way, these parameters, the way those come in is they, they determine um, the hypothesis function much in the same way of you know, our old setting. Um, but this is really a probabilistic model that we have here. And we're going to pick the thetas that maximize the probability of what we observed. Does that make sense? OK. Now, a few very simple steps here shows that when this problem here is equivalent to minimizing over theta of just the squared errors. Uh, essentially what happens is you, maximizing the, the, the product here is the same as, or maximizing the product here is the same as, minimi as maximizing the log of this thing, because uh, log is a monotonic function, so you could either maximize this or maximize the log. The nice thing about log is it lets you turn this product into a sum, so you can go from maximizing a product of things to maximizing a log of things, and while we're at it, let's just be, you know, take it one step further and minimize, let's talk about minimizing so far, let's minimize the negative log uh, some of the log terms here. Now we're going to plug in our exponential function here. When we take logs, you know, you get a log of this term, the log cancels out the exponent there. Uh, and so what you get is you get this log term here plus 1 over 2 sigma squared times this squared loss term here. Uh, and that's just equivalent to this, right? This term here does not depend on theta at all, so we don't, we can just ignore it. This term here, uh, though it has a sigma in it, it doesn't really matter because it's a scaling factor. And so whatever minimizes you know, sigma times this minimizes that thing too. So effectively, it's the exact same thing as just minimizing um, this squared loss. Okay, so this is, this is kind of nice because now we have another way of interpreting what we're doing when we're doing this least squares. What we're doing is we're maximizing the probability of observing the data under this Gaussian model. Of course, in some sense, this is kind of unsatisfying, too, because I shall mention this is, this is a technique called uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Um, this function here is called the likelihood function. And we usually view it, this full function here is actually a function of theta. That's the likelihood of theta, and we're picking theta to maximize the likelihood. Um, but it's also sort of unsatisfying because really we just went from picking a loss function to now choosing a distribution, right? Why did we choose Gaussian random variables here? Uh, if not for the fact that they actually lead to a nice optimization problem in the end, much like why we chose least squares. But there are cases where it's reasonable for sort of theoretical or empirical reasons to actually choose a Gaussian distribution. You can look at data, see if it follows the Gaussian distribution approximately, try to verify that empirically. And that can give you more confidence that both this is the loss function we should be using. We should be using a Gaussian model here. Therefore, we should be using least squares loss. And it also can sort of tell you that not only do we now have a um, sort of, a, a, not only can we solve for theta, but we also have a probabilistic model that tells us kind of the expected range of values for each new input, right? Because now for a new input xi, you actually have a distribution over possible y's, and that can kind of tell you the expected uncertainty, the expected range of those outputs. Um, you can do the same, I'm, I'm almost out of time, so you can, I just want to mention briefly, the same goes for, for logistic regression here. You can essentially define a probability model much like that one for um, binary random variables. So you can define a uh, probability of y given x as this logistic function here. Um, so if you plug in either plus 1 or minus 1 to y, this would give you a probability of it being either plus 1 or minus 1. Um, though this is the same function that we use for the, for the neural network, actually uh, neural networks typically are not using this as a probability function. They're just using it as a function that has some nice nonlinear properties. Here we're really treating it as a probability. Um, and the exact same thing happens where if you set up the, the maximum likelihood estimation task, task 
you get exactly this logistic loss function that we saw from the last lecture. So I won't dwell on that too much, but essentially the exact same thing here happens. You define a certain probabilistic model for these binary random variables, because it's a classification task, now a binary classification task. You solve the maximum likelihood estimation problem, and what you get out is the logistic loss function. So if you believe that probabilistic model up there, then the logistic loss function is a good one to optimize. Okay, that was that was pretty fast there. So I'm, I, I apologize if you hadn't seen that before. It's a little bit, it'd be kind of quick the first time, but it's really the exact same thing. The idea is we have a probabilistic model. We're going to pick parameters to maximize the likelihood of observing the data that we saw under that model, and what pops out is exactly the, the logistic loss function. That's the oscillation problem we get in the end. And by the way, just like with linear regression, we can now interpret the predictions of our model as probabilities, rather than just you know, numbers that the bigger they are, the more certain we are that it's uh, plus one, the smaller they are, the more certain we are that it's negative one. This kind of gives a, a sort of quantifies that. All right, I actually probably, will probably defer questions till see me in the break, because I want to mention one more thing, which is about evaluating algorithms. So, so far, what I've talked about, we've talked very briefly about, you know, how, how do you go about picking parameters? I think this is a question that a lot of people ask. How do you pick the k for k-means? How do you pick the regularization parameter, lambda, when you're doing classification or regression? Um, and yesterday, Nando also talked a lot about how do you pick, if you have many hyperparameters, how do you pick between them? Okay, right? So if you have a lot of different hyperparameters that kind of govern your algorithm, how do you pick the best ones? That wants to give you the best error, say. Um, and here's a very common approach, right? Remember, I told you before, the, the way you can do this, the way you can pick, you know, uh, lambda or k or whatever, is by doing this division of your data into a training set and a validation set. All right, so you have your tr whole training data. Say this. Say we'll use 20% or 30%, say, um, we'll use this validation and the rest will use this training. So just like on the graphs I showed you yesterday, Um, you, you know, you find the model parameters based upon this and then evaluate the error, the loss, based upon this held out set you did not train upon. And maybe you then use this validation error to pick, say, your value of lambda. Okay? Now a common mistake, well it's actually not that common anymore, but a mistake that you should never make is to do that, to, to run your machine learning algorithm here, to pick the best value of lambda, and then you report in your paper that you write up, you report the validation loss that you got. So is anyone, why is that a bad idea? Any guesses why that's a really bad thing to do? Yeah. Yeah. So effectively, we're training our, our theta, you can think of sort of training our theta parameters from this set. But we're really picking our lambda parameter based upon this, and that's sort of the best possible one you could find. And this is still training data. This is not indicative of new held out data. You are using it to actually choose the best value possible. So you are effectively training on your held out set. It's just you're not training your theta parameters, you're training your hyperparameters, your lambda, or whatever parameters you use for your patient optimizer maybe. And this was actually a very common thing for a while. People would just sort of I'll find the best parameters here and, and report what they got as the error. The correct way to do this is to actually separate out an additional testing set. So you take your data, you actually call this a testing set, and in the land of big data, you know, the fact that you, oh no, you're throwing away all this data here is less of an issue, right? Because you guys have so much data. Um, so it's probably okay if you use some of it for testing. You can also do things like Alex was talking about where you kind of do this online so you incorporate more training data as you go. 
But you take your test, your, your, your data set, and you divide it into a testing and training set, and then you subdivide this again into training and validation. And use this one, you know, do all your training and model building on this data, and then do this one only when you're finally done and ready to test on everything. And so the procedure essentially is break the data into training and testing sets, for example, 7030, break the training set into training and validation sets, um, choose your hyperparameters based upon this, you know, do all your learning here, test once and only once on your testing set, right? Because if you test any more than once, you are violating the principles of machine learning and the principles of statistics here. Um, and if it isn't good, then you, you, know, you throw away your results and scrap the paper, and then it's just a negative result, and you never look at it again. Um, of course, it doesn't actually happen, right? What happens is that in practice, people often do effectively overfit the testing sets by more or less, you know, if their algorithm here does not work, they'll try a new algorithm. And there's often some leakage in terms of people effectively letting performance on the testing set influence the type of algorithms they pick, the type of design they do, because you want that good performance when you're writing a paper, right? You, you, you want to make sure it's a good, you get a good result in the testing set. So you have to be careful with this. Um, but I think also in the, in the realm of big data, we have the ability to always pick new testing sets, to always sort of you know, do our training. If it doesn't work on this testing set, well, we throw this testing set away and pick a new one randomly. Right, because we don't want to bias ourselves towards good uh, performance on any one set. We want to really evaluate independently. So this is a little sort of you know one, one quick note here about how you evaluate your algorithms. When you do your reporting, make sure to do this kind of splits like this. Um, and then you know, don't, as much as you can, try not to overfit to the testing set. Though even the best people, I think, do that a little bit sometimes. Okay. Well, that is the end of this lecture, and uh, I think next up is, is Alex next up? Or you are? Oh, is Nando next up? Okay, Nando is. Okay, anyway.